Hello everyone, I hope you are all safe. This is Dr. Nerd and Amro Asaid. Today we are discussing bleeding disorders. But in order to understand the disorders, you need to have the big picture. So that's why we are starting with normal physiology. If you cut your finger, you will notice a bleeding, and in a few minutes you will notice that the bleeding stopped. This is hemostasis. So the process of cutting off the bleeding through the formation of a clot is hemostasis. And we will discuss how we form a clot in the following slides. A way to remember hemostasis is to divide the name. So heme sta and the stasis. Heme is blood, stasis is keeping something in place. So you are keeping the blood inside the blood vessels. It's divided into two phases, primary hemostasis, followed by secondary hemostasis, and we will start our discussion with primary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis involves the platelets, mainly involves the platelets. They are usually attached to the disrupted area in the blood vessel in order to form the block. So a way to remember that primary hemostasis is related to platelets is to remember that the B in a primary points to the B in the platelet. It's divided into four phases, vasoconstriction of the blood vessel, then adhesion of the platelets to the blood vessel, third, platelets degranulation, and fourth, platelets aggregation where they stick together. So the, bla the platelets stick together on the blood vessels. Let's discuss this pathway with further details. Let's say the cut happened here. The endothelium is now disrupted and the first immediate response is going to be from the surrounding endothelium as it releases endothelin. So endothelin released by endothelium, they look similar. Endothelin stimulates vasoconstriction and you can imagine that as the endothelial cells are constricting, they are becoming closer and as they are becoming closer, they are allowing less blood to leak. So this first step, vasoconstriction, is trying to minimize the bleeding. Now moving on to the second step, which is adhesion. It happens between the blood vessel through the expression of von Willebrand factor and the platelet through the expression of GP1B. The bound between these two is going to stimulate a morphologic change in the platelet. This takes us to step number three, degranulation, where the platelets release its granules. These granules have ADB and thromboxin. ADB stimulates the expression of a receptor, and this receptor is called GB2B3A. While on the other hand, thromboxin is going to attract the platelets to the site of injury. This takes us to step number four, aggregation, where the platelets aggregate together, they stick together. For example, this platelet is expressing the same exact receptor, GB2B3A, and these two platelets, this one and this one, are going to attach together through fibrinogen. Same as here, and same as here, and so on. This is a primary hemostasis, and I don't know if you can see him or not, but we have drawn an alien. I'm going to revise the entire pathway through this alien, so it helps you to remember later. Uh, the first step, vasoconstriction through the release of endothelin, is his arms. The second step, adhesion, which is the bound between GB1B and von Willebrand factor, is his face. The third step, degranulation, which is the release of ADB and the thromboxin, is his hair. The fourth step, which is aggregation, is his heart. Now, since we get the normal physiology, we can discuss the disorders. Remember primary hemostasis definition. It involves the attachment of platelets to the disrupted area of the blood vessel endothelium. So the main two components in primary hemostasis are the platelets and the blood vessel. And whenever something is wrong with one of them, then there is definitely something wrong with primary hemostasis. Our area of concern today isn't blood vessels disorders. It's platelets disorders. 
Platelet disorders are divided into two types. Quantitative, where the platelets count is low and that's the issue. And the qualitative, where the platelets count isn't the issue. The platelets function is the issue. What would a patient with a primary hemostasis disorder present with? We mentioned earlier that we need hemostasis to stop bleeding. So if hemostasis is in bed, we want to be the, the patient or the, the body won't be able to stop the bleeding. And, that, the, and that's why all the signs and symptoms are about the bleeding. The patient might bleed from the mucosal surfaces, uh, we'll have epistaxis, hematuria, GI bleeding, menorrhagia, intracranial bleeding. So all mucosal surfaces might be. One important point about intracranial bleeding is that it only happens in very severe cases. So for example, if the platelet count is very low. And the patient will have skin bleeding. Betechia, purpura, ecchymosis are all types of skin bleeding and they vary from each other depending on the size. The patient will have easy bruising and we mentioned why is that earlier. Then you do investigations. Why do we do investigations? First, to confirm the disorders and then, and second, to know why is the disorder present in the first place. So you do platelets count. If the platelets count is low, for example, then you know it's a quantitative platelet disorder. You do bleeding time where you, blick, you break the patient's uh, hand or finger and you see how much does it take for the bleeding to stop. If it takes, for example, an hour, then there is definitely something wrong. You do blood smear, which will help you to count the platelets and to check the shape of the platelets. So if there is something wrong with the platelets morphology, blood smear will help you to recognize it. Lastly, you do bone marrow biopsy. And why is that? We know that all blood cells originate from the bone marrow. So we do bone marrow biopsy to follow the platelets precursor, megakaryocytes. If megakaryocytes are low in bone marrow, then we know that there is something wrong with the bone marrow, not with the blood. We will start with the qualitative platelet disorders. And remember, by qualitative, we mean something is wrong with the platelet quality, not count. The first two disorders happen in step number two, adhesion. Bernard Solier syndrome happens as a result of GB1B deficiency, which, which is needed to connect the platelet to von Willebrand factor in the blood vessel. And so in this disease, this won't happen, and the adhesion won't happen as a result. The other disorder is von Willebrand disease, which happens either, either as a result of von Willebrand factor deficiency or as a result of von Willebrand factor defect. So von Willebrand factor in this case won't be functioning well. Either ways, adhesion won't happen because von Willebrand factor isn't present to connect the blood vessel to GB1B on the platelet. The other disorder happens, happens as a result of thromboxin deficiency. Why? Because of aspirin. Aspirin acts on cyclooxygenase enzyme, which is part of arachidonic acid pathway, by irreversibly inhibiting it. And so the end product, thromboxin, won't be produced and, platel and platelets won't be attracted to the site of injury. The other disorder is Glanzmann thrombasthenia. It happens as a result of GB2B3A deficiency. Do you, rem do you remember what we needed this for? We needed it to connect the platelets together and aggregate them together. And so when this is deficient, aggregation won't happen and step four is impaired. Moving on to quantitative platelet disorders. Remember, here the quantity is the issue. The count is the issue. The quality is completely fine. The disorder we are going to discuss here is called immune thrombocytopenic purpura or ITB. And as you can guess from the word immune, it's an autoimmune disorder. In this disorder, IgG antibodies would be attacking the platelets. One important to remember here is that the spleen is the primary site for antibodies production and destruction. And so whenever the antibodies are carrying the platelets, they will go back to the spleen in order to be destroyed. Patients with ITB 
are usually or would usually have high megakaryocytes count. And it makes sense because the body is sensing low platelets count, and so it will stimulate the production of the precursors, megakaryocytes, in order to compensate for the low count. ITB has two types, acute ITB, which happens in children following viral infection and is usually self-limiting. The patient would be fine within a few weeks. The other type is a chronic ITB. It happens usually in women of childbearing age. And we have two important points under this, disease, under this one, under this type. The first one is that pregnant women with a chronic ITB are at risk of transmitting the IgG antibodies to the baby. And so the baby would be born with thrombocytopenia. However, this thrombocytopenia is short-lived because whenever the vast antibodies are destroyed, the baby would be completely fine. The other, the other point is that megakaryocytes in this type would be normal because chronically, the body will stop comp compensating for the low platelet count. Treat treatment for ITB involves corticosteroids mainly. So the first line treatment is corticosteroids. IVIG is the second line treatment. It's, it's I, and IVIG stands for intravenous immunoglobulins. How is that helpful? It usually keeps the spleen occupied. So the spleen will be busy destroying the immunoglobulins. And so it won't be destroying the platelets that are, uh, the, the antibodies that are carrying the, the platelets. This way we are preserving more platelets. The third and last stage of treat, treatment is sublinectomy. And this one makes sense because when you take the spleen out, you would be removing the primary site for antibodies production and destruction.